it's a, it's a great honor for us to be here. Not many people ever think of a dialysis company, so for DeVita, on, on behalf of our 29,000 teammates, thank you for giving us a chance to yap a little bit about what we think about leadership. I will have to say one thing, though, to the dean, that within DeVita, if you call the musketeer clothing a costume instead of a uniform, you're fired. <laughs> the, uh, so, uh, the, uh, but we, one mistake we allow, um, for deans anyway. The uh, ownership, uh, you talked about the beginning, uh, 1999. Ownership, very important concept in, in, in leadership. And so if I can just jump into that for one moment, uh, since the dean reminds me of the history. Back in the beginning, we had a different name. Uh, we started off to do something very different, and I'll refer back to that uh, a time or two. We started out with the explicit intent of creating a special community, uh, to say we're a community first and a company second. Uh, and so just as uh, a village, uh, which is what we call ourselves, the DeVita Village, just as in a village, it doesn't do you any good unless you have a sustainable economy. It doesn't do you any good. All your good intentions for what you want to do for a community will fall apart. Uh, similarly, we wanted our company to be successful. Uh, but it was a community first. And as we began to, as we embarked upon this task of communicating with, at that point, about 12,000 teammates, uh, they, after a while, decided that they wanted to change the name of the company. More and more people, teammates we call them, would come up to to me and other executives and say, you know what, this place is so different. We want to get rid of the old name. Uh, other than the fact it's an ugly name, Total Renal Care, that'd be like starting a, a Ferrari company and calling it the Red Car Company. Um, the, uh, the, uh, we want a new name. And so we had the people select. Uh, thousands of people voted and picked the name of the new company, DeVita, which means he or she gives life. And then, and then hundreds of people voted and picked a new le- logo. And we went through a six, seven, eight-month process involving about 1,000 people to pick our core values. Actually sitting down in a room, forcing people to sit down in a room. In the midst of a turnaround, we're on the verge of bankruptcy, and put people in groups and say, okay, let's start with this list of values, 100 all motherhood and apple pie values. Start with that list and pick out which ones, if you presume for a moment that all, not all big companies have to be the same, if you presume for a moment that companies can be as different as people, what values would make the most difference for a dialysis company, for this dialysis company in this decade, in this country, which ones would make the most difference? And then it culminated in a vote in a room with 800 people, and that's where the core values came from. So the name, the logo, the core values all came from the, uh, the people of DeVita. Now, what I was asked to talk about today is a little bit of a personal life journey and a little bit about leadership. And uh, with respect to the personal life journey, I'm reminded of what someone once said, which is that usually when someone's starts to talk to you about their life story. It's a lot more about their story than about their life. Um, and so I'll try to, I'll try to inst- avoid that and, and speak the facts about different parts of my own journey uh, to the spot uh, where I sit here today. And then with respect to, to leadership, uh, I'll, I'll, try not to be, I'll try not to be boring. And I'll use a series of quotes as we step through it, uh, just because in general these other people are more articulate than I. Uh, and I think it's a better way to have a shot at retaining in a DeVita with 30,000 people spread across about 1,800 locations, it's very important that we talk in ways that people can take away and retain, that, that concepts get wrapped up uh, in, a, in a saying, in a slogan, in something that they can take away and remember, uh, particularly since uh, the majority of our teammates don't have college educations. I wanted to explain uh, uh, the, the HBS part of this. Uh, there, there could have been a lot of different reasons why I went to Harvard instead of GSB. One could be that of course, uh, that's a school where they force you through a rigorous educational process where the, where, <laughs> where the revered and hallowed case study method where you really grow, you know, this sort of inherent, innate, powerful leadership skills is used across the board. That could have been the reason. Um, it wasn't, however. The reason I went to HBS instead of GSB is that GSB rejected me. Uh, um, and so... So I, I just I just want to say that as of about five years ago we had we had one GSB person at this point uh, we have 16 and I think we got the ratio about right 16 GSB people working for one HBS person I think <laughs> I think uh, so so I I'm going to go up to the admissions office after this and just let them know that I, I just want to say thanks I just <laughs> that's all I want to all I want to say. Um, so, uh, so leadership. Uh, management is different than leadership. A lot of uh, wildly successful companies financially are not well-led. Some are not even uh, well-managed. 
in general, although it's, it's, it's important to not overstate these things. Management is more about the what. Uh, leadership is more about the why. Uh, management is more focused on the task. Leadership is more robust around the spirit with which a, a, tax is, a, a task is executed. Um, and, and it's important to, to think about this distinction. And I'll go ahead and go to the next slide, Brett. The, uh, because management is a business skill. So if you want to get better at management, you accumulate tools in your business toolbox. You become a better business person. Uh, so management is a business skill. Leadership, uh, we think, is dominantly a human skill. And if that is true, if that premise is true, then in order to become a better leader, you have to become a better human. Uh, and we think that is a simple but powerful truth that, uh, that one has to think about because if you believe it's true, you have to internalize that and approach becoming a better human with the same sort of creativity, rigor, and relentlessness that one uses to acquire business skills. Uh, and I think in many ways that's equally, equally difficult. I should go ahead to the next one. The, uh, there's, different forms of, or different situ- there's different situations where leadership is required. In some cases, it's quite easy. For example, if you're a, a captain in the Marines and there's a, a war to be won, there's not a lot of debate about what the mission is. When I came to what was the old company and there was a turnaround, there was not much debate about the business aspect of the mission. So there's times when the world delivers you a relatively clear mission. Uh, there's also times when the world delivers you a relatively motivated team. So when you hire six people from Stanford uh, Business School uh, to come and work for you in a small investment management firm, motivation is you, you, motivation is not really an, an issue uh, there. there. There's other subtleties. Uh, but there are, there are times in which the world delivers to you a relatively clear mission or a relatively motivated uh, team of folks or group of folks to work on it. Uh, there are other areas of life where the leader uh, creates the mission. Uh, and that can be a purely business external objective. Uh, but separately, it can be more about the type of environment in which people are going to work while they're pursuing that objective, uh, which could be happier, more fun, more innovative, whatever. And the third level of leadership is when you actually work uh, to create a world that's more fulfilling. Uh, for a lot of other human beings. And that's easier if it's a small number and harder if it's a big number. Uh, And so whenever you talk about leadership, it's pretty important to segregate out when you're just talking about having the most market share uh, or the most profit growth, uh, something like that. That's one form of leadership. It is a radically different form of leadership to want to create a highly differentiated environment for the human beings in sort of normal ways. And it's a whole other level to talk about trying to create fulfillment, particularly if a part of what you're focused on is human beings that are not like the folks here in this room. But a lot of you are going to be uh, reaching leadership management positions, which could be leadership positions, where you've got a lot of folks not like you uh, working for you and a lot of folks not like you uh, that, uh, whose lives you're going to influence. And so this is where you have to start developing a very personal definition of what leadership uh, means to you. And that's why we use this phrase a lot at Davidica, begin with the end in mind. Uh, Stephen Covey made it well known, but it, it came from a as I understand it, a Buddhist monk before that. Begin with the end in mind is a very powerful concept at two, two, two times in, in life. Uh, one is right now, or whenever you decided you wanted to become a distinctively strong uh, leader. I still remember the time. I, I vividly remember the time in fifth grade when the teacher said, who wants to run for student council? And, and, uh, and I decided I wanted to, to do that with all the nervousness of putting up posters and that, that terrible day when you walked up to the front of the class to give your halting uh, speech. Uh, and, and, I, and I remember a part of what I literally thought is, gee, I, I'd like, you know, as I sort of look out at read books and stuff like that, I'd like to be a person uh, someday who gets to lead something. And uh, as horrified as I am, I, I better, I guess you got to start doing it. And, and as ignorant as I was in so many ways, uh, that's one of the few things in life I got like that le- got right. Leading is like everything else. If you want to get good at it, you have to do it. You have to do it. And doing just normal things in normal ways. Uh, following all conventional paths and taking conventional mainstreams within whatever companies you're with or firms you're with or schools you're in is, is not the way to practice leadership. It's a way to learn and practice a lot of other things. And so if you take it upon yourself, if the end you have in mind as of this moment or a year ago or two years ago or three months from now to become a strong leader, then you better start thinking about what it takes. Uh, and part of it takes doing it. Uh, and that doesn't mean you sort of make up a leadership task. And part of it is studying people who do it, learning about it, because it is just like everything else. Some of you are more naturally gifted in this area with either certain functional skills or charismatic skills or certain value skills uh, or value-based behaviors. Uh, but but it, is, uh, 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 it is a function. It is a product of cumulative learning 
and practice just like everything else. So that's so one juncture at which this begin with the end in mind concept is relevant is like is t- today. Uh, if X years from now you'd like to be uh, a skilled uh, a skilled leader, a strong leader, uh, a leader who does add value to the lives of a lot of other human beings who are not like uh, the fortunate few in this room. Uh, a second time when we begin with the end in mind is really important is when you're starting whatever you do next. Um, when you walk in that first time uh, in that environment or to your new team or to your organization or the first time you're put in charge of something significant and you need to look out to folks and say, this is the end I have in mind. And is it going to be a narrow end? Is it going to be, I'd like us to increase sales by 13% a year and increase margins slightly each year, uh, and I'd like to have one new product every three years? That's one end in mind, and then that's the end that people will relate to you uh, uh, around as a leader. It can be, you know, I'd like to do all those things, and I'd like to create a very strong uh, and distinctive culture within our group. I'd like us to be more team-oriented, blah, 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 whatever that is. Or it could be something much bolder, either in humanistic terms or in innovative terms or whatever else. Um, But you only get one opportunity when you're launching a new quest to articulate uh, with everyone paying very significant attention to what your end is. Uh, So when we started at DeVita seven years ago, we went out, and remember this is a turnaround. We're technically bankrupt. If one bank had asked for one dollar, we would have uh, had to fold fold up our tents. And so we'd spend uh, our very first executive retreat. We spent the first two-thirds of the day talking about how the heck we make payroll, uh, how we improve our cash collection, how we get rid of the shareholder lawsuit, uh, how we fill the half of the executive's positions where people had been terminated or quit because they were so sure we were going bankrupt, uh, how we deal with the SEC investigation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we used the last third to start talking about the mission and the values. And a third, of the, a third of the people in the room had a positive reaction to that, the executives saying, well, this is different. Uh, it must be pretty important because we're talking about it at a time when the, the ship's almost sinking and we've just been bailing all morning and now we're starting to talk about uh, some island that we can't even see. Um, a third were sort of in the middle saying, okay, this is interesting. I will wait and see. And a third uh, were very negative, feeling that this was either foolish, naive, manipulative. Do you think you're going to keep us with with some namby-pamby concept of a mission and values and creating a special community. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to get up in front of a group in that setting when you know that a very substantial percentage, uh, the ma- by far the majority are not going to buy into what you're saying, are going to be at least modestly uncomfortable, and a very significant minority or maybe half actually think you're full of it. Uh, and, that's, and that's the reality that often happens. If you want to say as a leader you aspire to building something that's highly differentiated, that's quite special. And it, and it doesn't exist yet today. It's very easy to come into a place that already has a healthy culture and say, I'm going to sustain it. I'm going to enhance it a bit on the margins. Uh, very different. But that's what, that's what leadership is about. And you only get that one shot because that's when people start to sense in that act and all the acts that follow that, in fact, you do fervently, sincerely, vehemently have that end in mind. And if you don't have it in mind, you, it's never going to happen. If you don't have it in mind, you're not willing to talk about it, then the day-to-day crush of operating reality will squeeze it out because you're going to have bad bosses, you're going to have tough budgets, you're going to have competitors who do difficult things. And what tends to get squeezed out in all those situations is the dream. So it becomes more of a job, hopefully a highly successful job, a very remunerative job. Uh, but it, then it reverts to being a pretty normal a normal job for you and the people that work for you. That's the, that, that's the natural tendency uh, to tend back towards the mean of human behaviors. And only you, the leader, can make clear that that's not acceptable, uh, that that's not the end. And by making it clear, making it public, then you start to squeeze out time. So one thing we did back there in the beginning is, is the turnaround is every six to eight weeks, we get on the phone with the top 700, 800 people. And in addition to giving a business update, like, yes, we met payroll again, uh, and other things like that, uh, we would ask and answer the following questions. What is the incremental evidence since the last phone call? We call these voice of the village calls. What's the incremental evidence that we're serious about the mission and values. We didn't have to discuss each component of the mission. We didn't have to discuss each of the core values. And in the first six, seven months, the core values didn't exist yet, just the mission. But we had to discuss a couple. And this is very powerful, because when you say something out loud, people in general, if they say something up out loud, they want to live up to it, even if it's highly qualitative, having to do with their own behaviors, their own aspirations, et cetera. So we said it way out loud. And so the way that worked in the real world is that Every six weeks or so, if you say the call was every eight weeks, two weeks before, you'd be sitting there at 10 o'clock. You would have just finished working on some budget, trying to retain some customer, negotiating some 
pay our contract, whatever, in our world. And you'd say, excuse my language, but you'd say, oh, shit, that call's coming up in two weeks. And we have to answer that question again. Uh, what's the incremental evidence that we're serious about creating a differentiated place with respect to, uh, to, with respect to our mission and then subsequently our values? Uh, but you would do it. What, you, what it is is that often uh, the idea that didn't flow naturally while you were already working 16 hours a day came out then. Well, gee, if we were really serious about that, we would do this. We would create a scholarship program for the kids and grandkids of our teammates. If we were real serious about this, we would do village service days where we serve the communities uh, where, we, uh, where we live. Uh, if we were serious about this, uh, we would launch an environmental program. If we were serious about this, uh, we would have medical missions that go overseas. If we were serious about this, we'd have a safety net to k- k- take care of our teammates who make $25,000, $30,000 a year, and when cancer strikes a spouse or when a fire burns down or whatever, there is no safety net for those people. And unless we're there to provide it, uh, their life as they knew it is over. And so that's what happens with every successive forced public event of accountability is we came up with additional programs, real-world programs that did did substantiate the premise that we wanted to be different. And the message is, had we not had that public reckoning, had we not had the public bar that we set out, had we not uh, explicitly said the end in mind despite the embarrassment that came with it and the discomfort and some people feeling manipulated or very skeptical or even cynical, had we not done that, I can tell you right now we would have only done half of what we have done over the last six or seven years, which is to create a place with 29,000, 30,000 people, a whole bunch of which, a very high percentage of which, think they work for a different kind of place, where we bought a similar company a couple of years ago, and their turnover, using the same wages, working in the same markets, in the exact same business, often just blocks apart, their turnover was 38% higher, even though we paid the same. And it was all work environment uh, different. Our clinical outcomes better than other places, uh, not driven because we're more clinically insightful, uh, but because people have a different feeling around the place that they work. Can you go ahead and flip to the next one, please? The, uh, in order to get yourself to navigate the path of, uh, of, of leadership, it's so important to remember uh, that just as beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, leadership is in the eyes of the lead. Because uh, we each have our, uh, so I have my self-image of what I'm like as a leader. You have your self-image of what you're like as a leader. In general, we think we're pretty good, pretty good men and women. Uh, it doesn't matter at all. Uh, what, what good leaders do is make sure that they know how other people experience them and attack that with very significant rigor. Uh, so, for, for example, in our situation, everybody, including me, uh, gets a review every year done by an outside person where you're scored with respect to your behaviors uh, as they relate to the mission and values. And for me, for example, at my request, my scores go to the board of directors. Uh, so if, if people are thinking that, whoa, uh, the, the, the words on that banner, the words on that plaque are nice but not real, they get to tell the board of directors that. They get to tell, they give me the gift of that, of that feedback. Uh, and this is a, a relatively extreme case. But the important point is there's a very good chance that half of what you think about how other people experience you as a leader is probably wrong. Uh, it, it, it misses the nuances. Uh, it, it misses the test of if they were asked whether or not Mary Jones or Tom Smith really intensely believes about certain core values or in creating a certain type of work environment, it misses the fact that in a lot of cases they'll say, no, I'm not saying Tommy or Mary are bad people, but they, they don't hold those things that, that close to their heart. Uh, the, 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 business, the business imperatives, the business objectives trump every time in such a significant way that while they're, they, don't, they don't violate those rules, I would, never, I would never tell you that they're a leader who's actively promoting those rules, those values, those behaviors. So, so leadership is in the, in the eyes of the lead. How does all this relate uh, to some near-term decisions for you folks? Um, well, picking a job, picking the job you're going to choose when you leave here. Again, this is all in the context of if, if you are contemplating wanting to become a, a differentially uh, talented, effective, strong leader, particularly for people not like those in this room. Uh, well, then in, in choosing a place to go work, uh, it, it is not logical to pick a place that doesn't talk a lot and invest a lot and care a lot about leadership. I mean, it just, it, why, why would you go to a place? If you want to, really want to learn something, don't go to a place where most of the people are not good at it. Uh, that's, not, that's not wise. You might do that later in life to run and transform it. Uh, but right now, if you want to become a great marketer, don't go to a lousy marketing place. Uh, yeah, you'll get more res- marketing responsibility, perhaps, but that's not the, what you need to become great. One of the things you do to need to become great is learn from people who are really good at it and study them with great intensity. So as you 
pick a place, think about this. Uh, and, and secondarily, think about the broader DNA of the place you choose. All organizations have DNA. Uh, DNA typically doesn't change much. I'm always struck now that I'm getting so darn old uh, when I talk about the, the brand image of different firms uh, on the campuses here and at Harvard and Northwestern and talk about the word, adjectives you would use to describe different, different companies, different firms. And what's so amazingly striking is that they're virtually the same as if you had sat down with eight students 25 years ago. Uh, virtually the same. And despite all the trials and tribulations that different firms have had and, and things that have gone on in their industries, the adjectives end up being the same. DNA runs pretty deep in most organizations unless someone takes very active steps to change it. So respect the DNA of the entity and don't be misled by the DNA of some particular little department or team you're joining um, because unless it's your aspiration to stay there, uh, it's very difficult to contemplate DNA shifting and it is very relevant, again, particularly in the context of learning about leadership and whether or not it's a culture that treasures, nurtures, celebrates, rewards, and invests in leadership in addition to management. Um, for me, uh, after business school, that translated to a decision to, to join Bain, which was for two reasons. One, I wanted some place, I wanted a consulting firm that was more implementation oriented because I knew I wanted to be an executive someday. And second, because, uh, because versus the other places that I was looking at, they seemed more team oriented, which to me had a lot to do with what I wanted to do when I grew up. I wanted to be a team leader. That was, just, uh, that was my end in mind. And so that was a very heavy criteria, separate from anything else in picking where I went to work. So I just encourage you to contemplate the same stuff. Now I'm going to switch gears radically and switch to uh, marriage. Um, the, uh, because, in fact, uh, it has, and I, since I spend time every year with uh, first years and second years contemplating jobs, and, and often the conversation turns to uh, what is sort of the rest of life like, uh, marriage, the obvious thing to say, marriage is a relatively important effect on the, on the rest of your life. Um, but what's striking for my, my wife and I, uh, who was also uh, an HBS grad and then became one of the first female venture capitals in, in America, is how many of our friends no longer have marriages. They're either about a third of them, a little over a third are divorced as we look across the class roles, and there's about another 15, 20 percent where the, where the love in the marriage is dead. Uh, and so that's pretty striking because these people, they're, they're from schools like this. A bunch of them are from this school. And, uh, and what we see is there are couples where one of two things happen to the ones that are most likely to have a dead marriage or, a, or an ended marriage. Uh, one is when there's a, there's a real differential capacity for continued personal growth. Uh, and the way this is, relates to, to leadership in part uh, is that to become a strong leader over time takes that sort of commitment to sustained personal growth, that sort of introspectiveness, self-awareness, courage to confront your weaknesses, courage to talk about them openly, Courage to talk openly in public about how their people experience you in a way that you don't think is fair, you don't think is accurate, but it's just how they experience you. Uh, well, similarly in, in, in marriages and a lot of the divorces and stuff we've seen are from where there's a different trajectory of personal growth. Uh, and the other is when one of the, one of the spouses uh, gets way too focused on, on work uh, and there's a tremendous disconnect on that, on that balance issue. Uh, and, and how one's life goes has dramatic impact on what kind of leader you can be. Uh, there's, a, there's a great Buddhist quote, uh, one does not pour from an empty cup. And, uh, and a great marriage adds to your cup, uh, and a low-quality marriage takes away from your cup. And so it's an, it's an obviously important part of life, um, and some of the principles that make it important and take it up or down are the same kind of things, ironically, and maybe not intuitively obviously, uh, to, what it means, to what it means to be a leader of other human beings. The, uh, in talking about leadership, there's always that question, what makes a, what makes a good leader? And it's a, and it's a relevant question. It's worth discussion. There's lots of lists out there, lots of different books, lots of different articles, uh, all worth, uh, many worthwhile in, in my mind. Uh, there's a lot of overlap in those, in those lists as well, and some lists are slightly more appropriate for someone if you're a CEO or president than they are if you're something else, um, but it's valuable. Uh, from, from my experience uh, at this point, I say, gee, those lists, they, those are important, but they tend to be behaviors or skills or practices or disciplines. 
And, and what I've come to appreciate more over time is how much it's not so much of those that matter, um, but what are the attributes, the values, uh, the aspects of the person's being that allowed them to develop those skills, consistently practice those behaviors, possess that discipline, et cetera. So that there's, there's a root cause underneath a lot of those lists which doesn't get as much attention and has a lot more to do with the, with the human being. And on my list uh, in that category, and I think, I think we have this uh, on a slide. Uh, Brett, if you can go ahead and put it up. Um, well, this is, uh, I'll, I'll do a quick segue here. This is a different subject. This is more of those, a more typical list of what you would find in an article. Uh, the, the point to make here is that in, in our organization, we went through a significant process with hundreds of people to define what it meant to be a DeVita leader. Uh, and again, it, the exact list doesn't matter, uh, but what matters a lot is having a very serious conversation about it and forcing every individual to reflect on what they think is most important, to hear what other people think most important, and to instill this in their mind. Uh, and then what we do uh, is try to remind people of what they said uh, a good leader was. Because, uh, and we were talking earlier today, I was with, uh, with, with Professor O'Reilly, and, and the issue of reminding organizations and leaders about core values and the mission and what it means to be a leader is a very big deal. And the metaphor I use, it's like, uh, people go, why do people go to church? Now, some people go to church every Sunday. You say, why do you go to church every Sunday? Uh, because you hear you've, you've had that psalm read to you before. You've probably heard a similar sermon before. No, you go to church to be reminded. Uh, well, similarly, if you're trying to create in the real world, the real hectic world, the real world with budgets and turnover and family conflicts, et cetera, the real world of managing teams, building teams, trying to create a differentiated environment, you've got to figure out a way to remind people of what they dreamt of, remind people of what they aspired to. And one of the ways you do it is by making sure there's a reasonable consensus on the right words, one set of right words, and then making sure people are reminded of it. And that can be through banners. We do it through songs. We do it through slogans. We do it through an annual exercise where every, every single person has to sit for half an hour uh, at, at a meeting where we're all in the same room and reflect and fill out their own mission and values report card. And then if they want to, talk about it with others uh, that are around their table. It's a part of every professional development review that the first thing you get is, is your most important message about your performance and your professional development over the past year. The second section is comments on you in the context of every one of our core values and every component of our mission. So a huge amount of not only continuing to develop yourself as a leader, but your organization is this issue of reminding. Uh, and hence, in that sense, any list that's a write-up at your organization is probably the right list. But underneath it, and Brad, if you could go to the next one, please. The... Uh, that what I think, uh, as I look at who have emerged as successful uh, leaders who create fulfilling environments for other people over time, they tend to have these sort of core points of view, core values, things that are in their being, and that allows them to do all those other things uh, without it being painful and allowing them to break the system. First of all, they're committed, and people know they're committed, uh, and that can be to a particular set of values, a particular type of environment, or whatever, but there's a, there's a palpable commitment uh, which is deeply held. Uh, and not tactical, and not just situational, but beyond that. Uh, second, they're personally secure. Uh, it is so, you're going to have weaknesses, people in your organization are going to have weaknesses. If you can't get to the point where you can get up in front of a crowd and say, you know what, I'm, I'm KT, that's what they call me at work. I, I got a lot of feedback, and I am micromanaging. Uh, boy, and then this next year, I get a lot of feedback, and I'm showing too much anger when someone underperforms. It's fine to give objective feedback, totally inappropriate and unfair for a CEO to show anger. And these are all real examples, by the way. Uh, uh, KT, you know, this year, well, you, you got rid of that anger thing that was good, but in debates, you sort of have to be right, you know, and, and you have the benefit of position, and why don't you grow up and stop having to be right? Uh, and so if you can't get to the point, and these are all real-world examples, on, on, unfortunately, um, <laughs> the, uh, some of which I've conquered and some which I haven't, then you're not on the path to being a great leader because right? you're not personally secure enough to face the truth and discuss it with people. And your organization's never going to be. Never going to be. And then when you're going to tell them what's wrong with them, where they have to grow, they don't necessarily want to listen to you much because they say, well, what are you yapping at me for about micromanagement or this behavioral deficiency? Because your faults are legendary, Kent. And uh, until, we, until we get them out on the table, just uh, back off. Uh, so it's a very big deal. 
is personally secure. It communicates, and by that, it doesn't have to have anything to do with your ability to articulate, your ability to speak. Now, communication is primarily nonverbal uh, when it comes to leadership. Uh, the fact that you can give a good speech only matters if everything you've done before it and everything you've done after it supports it. Everything you've done behaviorally in terms of decisions. Otherwise, in fact, the speech is a huge negative uh, because people look up there and say it's a fraud or maybe something short of that, but not reinforcing, not powerful, not motivating, not instructive. Uh, so communicating is about listening in particular. So what's one thing we do at DeVita? Is it's a rule. Every executive at DeVita, whenever you're any place where there's more eight teammates, you have to do a town hall. That's expected. Now, of course, sometimes it happens it just can't quite work. But there's hundreds and hundreds of town halls. I personally do lots and lots of town halls everywhere, all over DeVita, every year. And it doesn't really matter what gets discussed. Of course, it matters to some extent. What really matters is that they get to hear any question being asked, any advice being given, and they get to see how a leader, an alleged leader, responds in public all the time. And we get is a, people who come to us from other companies and they say, we have seen the CEO or the COO or the C-whatever more times in the last two years than we ever saw uh, the CEO or whomever in the previous 15 years. And they don't bring up, they don't say, and Kent, you made a good comment or you said something smart. Uh, they just say, no, you were there, you listened, you answered the questions. That's, that sort of works. That sort of works very powerfully. That's, that's communication. That's communication. Uh, and it's huge. It's huge because we're back to this thing where leadership is a human skill. And as an old saying, they don't, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you're not willing to get out there and listen and have a team that goes out there and listens and communicates through their actions in those kind of ways, then the rest of the stuff just doesn't, the, the, the leadership train stops. It just does. Um, being accountable is a big deal. When we do our annual, what we call State of the Village speech, uh, to all sorts of people, including uh, shareholders. The first slide is always the areas where the CEO and the COO, being myself and the CEO, underperformed. That's how we started off with. Uh, because how are we going to talk about all the rest of the stuff, and particularly some of the good stuff and other people's failures, unless we kick it off by talking about ours? It turns out accountability is just one of the most powerful differentiators because relatively few leaders get it right. Relatively few leaders will just calmly stand up and say, you know what, this went wrong. And, and, and I own it. I own it. And you know what? I'm not going to blame the wind. I'm not going to blame the, the budget. I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, there's a whole lot of extenuating. And what happens is the audience will start, if you take accountability, people will start to say, well, you know what? That budget was kind of screwed up to start with. Well, you know what? We never knew the competitor was going to do that. They will, they will fill in the rest if you start from a spot which says, you know, I'm accountable for that. I own this. And if you don't do that, it gets very difficult when you want to own successes. I just love it when people, every year you have people come in halfway through a year uh, and, and certain people are behind budget and they go, well, the following six unexpected, uncontrollable things went wrong. That's why I'm behind budget. Now, no one comes halfway through the year that's ahead of budget and says, the following unexpected, uncontrollable things happen and that's why I'm ahead of budget. <laughs> so it's a fascinating world out there. It only works one way. The uh, only bad unexpected things happen. Never a good unexpected thing happens. And then lastly, uh, a, a, the most powerful leaders serve. They serve the cause, or they serve the people, or they serve some combination. Uh, when people sense that you're the boss, you get to make decisions, you get paid more, you get a bigger office, whatever that is, they don't, they don't mind that as long as you serve the cause that they serve, or you serve them, or both. That's, that is when people start to say, I will follow this person, I, I trust this person, because they care about me, and they either serve the cause I love, or they serve me, or both. And, and again, you can, you, can, you can do a lot of other things, but if you don't get those basics, it ain't happening. It ain't happening unless you're in a small seven-person investment management firm where really you know, leadership isn't quite the same issue as it is for most human beings out there uh, working at different levels. I was at, was at Bain. I, I want to be an executive. I left, went to a dialysis company in 1991. Um, should have been fired in the first year. I was just terrible. I was intent on proving how smart I was. Um, to, to, to a lot of people who didn't have Harvard MBAs and Stanford undergrads. If the, if the guy who was place I was taking to CEO wasn't a very generous, uh, mature man, I would have been, I would have been fired. Uh, wasn't. So I got to sort of learn. I had training wheels in an easier business. I got very, very uh, lucky. I intended to leave that business uh, within a year or two uh, because it was, for me, it was, not, it, was, it was the opposite of a sexy business, dialysis. It's a lot of Medicare patients. Everyone dies. So I said, I'm going to prove I can be a CEO of a public company, and then I'm going to go on to something that, that is more befitting uh, my race driver status in life. <laughs> and, 
And, and what happened instead is I fell, in, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it because there are lots of blue-collar Americans uh, working hard, uh, doing good stuff. And to add value to their lives found out to be this amazing, fulfilling thing. Not because I, I, I planned it that way, uh, but it happened that way in front of my eyes. And so I didn't leave. I stayed uh, until we got taken over, unfortunately, uh, by a much larger company. And, and that was probably the only company in the history of the New York Stock Exchange that when the board voted uh, that they had to accept this offer from this European company, the CEO cried in the boardroom. Uh, and they just stopped the meeting while I cried because, the, because this beautiful thing that we had going uh, as my sort of aspirations of building a community were just starting to form uh, intellectually and functionally uh, was dashed by this, this wonderful large amount of cash, but unfortunately which terminated uh, the dream of a different place. Then I ran a different company, uh, and it was a failure uh, from which I learned more about myself and people than I had learned in all previous years. Um, and then I was done. I was going to I was going to uh, resign, take six to nine months off of my family, uh, and go into the for-profit, uh, the not-for-profit world. Uh, so when I got headhunter calls, I said I would say nope. You know, I'm taking six to nine months off of my family, and then uh, don't know what I'm going to do. Call me then, because I didn't want to uh, preclude myself from maybe change if I changed my mind. Um, and then I got a call from this dialysis company, this Total Renal Care, and I, I literally picked up the phone uh, and and was going to give the same pitter-patter I'd given to other search firms, um, and I have no idea what I said, um, because all these, the, the, the memories of how my experience in that setting were the most fulfilling I'd ever had professionally came flooding back, and I, I don't know what I said. Uh, I do remember the next part. Uh, I went home, and my wife Denise was sitting at her desk, and I said, Denise, that total renal care called, uh, which, and she looked over her shoulder and said, well, we've been expecting that because I'd been a CEO in that industry and was regarded as successful, and there was a turnaround, and it was in the same state of California. And she, so she said, we've been expecting that, and she turned back, because, of course, I was supposed to give the answer I'd given to everybody else. And, uh, and then she, five, six seconds later, since I'm still standing there, uh, and she turned uh, with a look of very intense anger uh, <laughs> and, and said, Kent, you didn't. And I, like a little boy, said, didn't what? Yeah. The, uh, and, uh, and she said, you didn't tell them you would interview for that job. Uh, and I said, I didn't, uh, but I want to. And so we had this hellacious conversation because she said, you know, you testosterone, ego-driven, son of a gun, so to speak. <laughs> you know, what happened to the family time? What happened to this? And I, and I said, well, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's some truth in what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, um, but there's this also this other thing, which I think I think I can live my uh, professional dream. I think I can add great value. I I I, I like these people. Uh, this is this uh, this is a pitch I want to try to hit. This is where I think I can I can do everything I wanted to do if I took a not-for-profit job. Uh, I can I can build a community here. I, I know this place. I, I this is what I think I can do. Uh, and so we went up and down for a couple of weeks, uh, just just a very stress stressful time for our marriage as we as we wrestled with it. Uh, and we decided ultimately, as a as a family, that that we would do it um, because it was at the time when I what felt like a burden at the time, which is it was a turnaround. And it was going to be very hard in the family. It was in L.A. and she made very clear we weren't moving from this area, the Bay Area. So I was going to be commuting up and down away from our two kids. Uh, so a heavy, heavy, heavy issues, um, but we decided uh, that this was an opportunity for me to live my values uh, in a way that I might not ever get another chance to. Just can't count on that. That second, our kids I would probably take away the right message that even though Daddy was gone more, he was gone because he was trying to do good and he loved his job very, very much. Uh, and so we, we gave it a try. And so the, the burden... Uh, of that decision turned out to be a gift because I've never entered a job with such clarity about the end in mind. And since then, we've done a whole lot of things, uh, only recruiting folks using our mission and values of parameter, helping develop people as human beings, reinforcing this, honoring those folks who behave differently as human beings more than we honor folks who are better at business. We reward them with greater bonuses and stock option exercises, but we honor in the special nights and special days, we honor those people who are better human beings not the ones that are better business people. Um, and, and so it's been this glorious adventure. So, so my uh, final sort of comment is that 
is that once you find, once you're near uh, the area that you think uh, can allow you to sort of in an unfettered way uh, let, have your passions express themselves in a professional way, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of business it is, it doesn't have to be not-for-profit, uh, just jump into it with all, all your heart and soul uh, because you can't go very far wrong can't go very far wrong. And too many, there's an old Indian saying it, that most people go to their graves with their music still inside. Um, and so just be sure uh, that as you climb up the, the whatever ladder uh, that you're focused on, that all GSB students get to climb, uh, that you figure out where your music is uh, because it's terrible. We have so many 51-year-old friends uh, who are not fulfilled. Uh, they're financially very secure and they're not fulfilled. There's, in fact, no correlation with our HBS class with net worth and fulfillment. Um, and so uh, those are my closing thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.